Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and one of the biggest money lessons you've learned during your lifetime. We'll review one popular author's list and add in our own. As today, we're joined by one half of the Talking Real Money podcast, Don McDonald. And say hello to a money maven who can turn pennies into profit, Paula Pant. And last but not least, we got the OG of frugality, Ebenezer Scrooge. Nah, he's out tracking down some ghosts who owe him some money. We just got his even stingier brother, Lent Pento. But that's not all. Halfway through the show, I'll share some NYC-themed trivia. And now, a guy who is the Indiana Jones of finance, it's Joe Saul Cihai. Is that because you've got a release coming out that's going to bomb Joe? <laughs> no, it's because he's almost as old as Harrison Ford. Jeez, <laughs> holy, I can't even talk and they're laying into me already. Hey, everybody, welcome to Friday. we got a surly group with us today. I'm Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And I was going to take exception with some of that, Doug, because let's go deep under Los Angeles where Len Penzo joins us. You're not stingy. You were handing out lasagna like it's... Uh, like it's uh, I, Halloween candy. I'm not, I'll, tell you, yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm not cooking at all today, Joe, because it is hot. I'm miserable. Everybody's, you know, it is so hot out there. How hot is it? Well, it's because the cows are giving evaporated milk. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it only took, uh, please let the record show, it took 37 <laughs> seconds until I'm we working, got the first. I, I've been working on my delivery for Doug, so... <laughs> Fabulous. And joining us from Manhattan, and apparently we're going to be doing some Manhattan-based trivia later, Paula Pant from Afford Anything's here. Oh, I'm excited about this trivia contest then, if there's going to be some Manhattan-based trivia. You know, we don't have OG here, which means, Paula, we got to try to get you to get you ahead of the game further, you know? Right, if right. You, get, I'm, yes. you know, I'm, what, in second place? You're going to brag about that. You've been bragging about that all week to your friends, haven't you? Oh, yeah. I've updated my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> yes. And the guy who I'm sure is updating his LinkedIn profile right now because he's here with us today. I seriously doubt that's why he would update his LinkedIn profile. Don McDonald's here. How are yeah. you, man? Yeah, I'm good. It's so nice to be back. I'm feeling the love again. I was missing the gang in the basement. Thank you for welcoming me back. How have you and our other brother, Tom, been lately? We've been busy, 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 making lots of podcasts and doing stuff like you guys do. Just and for keep the cranking them out. Three people that don't know Talking Real Money. I noticed on, uh, on Apple Podcasts, they talk about shows that other people listen to and they listen to your show. Mm -hmm. Obviously, because uh, Paul is here and we're there, we always afford anything next to us. But then Talking Real Money's, right after that but for people that don't know talking real money tell everybody what you guys do oh oh i bet you'll never guess <laughs> we talk real money <laughs> shut up i yeah, no, really uh what we do is we do a, a slightly more investment centric version of what you guys do is we try to guide people down a reasonable path to reasonable wealth in a reasonable period of time with reasonable expectations and reasonable risk. It's all about reason and just being sensible and straightforward. We, we, we rarely have guests unless it's somebody like Joe Saul Cihai or Paul Merriman uh, and his, you know, in his little Robin Hood gang. Um, <laughs> but we, we don't have a lot of guests on because we don't we, we're not we don't want to have a bunch of people who are confusing people about what to buy and what to do. We want to keep it simple. So we've been doing this for literally ever um i mean i've been doing a talk, financial talk show now since 1988 oh my goodness oh, yeah. oh my god way back when way back when when it was actually there was actually radio back then and, and by the way lens feeling really good about that because we generally rag on him for his age because he's like a year older than me so uh -huh. i'm i beat y'all <laughs> so how you feeling now len <laughs> oh, no. You gotta be better, say. Len. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of verklempt from just, uh, just. Uh, <laughs> this is awesome that I'm not. I already, I already got the uh, old joke on Twitter for my, on that you sent me, Joe. Some one of your, one of the uh, stackers just couldn't resist oh, no. making an old joke about me. Oh no! Did they really? 
Yeah, you sent it. You're actually like, you <laughs> Did they really? <laughs> you How old are you now, me. Joe? Wait. <laughs> Oh, I guess they did. Yes. Well, uh, that sounds reasonable, Don. After all that, I think all that sounds very reasonable. Yes. We got Don McDonald here. We got Len Penzo, Paula Pant, David Doug is here. We're going to talk about one of famous author's meditations about his life. And the reason for that is, you know, it's halfway through the year. It's just over halfway through the year. and, And time just slips by and you're like, where did it go? And I haven't done anything. So how do I look back and maybe get some good lessons? We're going to do that in just a moment. But Don, it's been a while since you've been on. Have you seen the updated list of rules when you guest on this show? No, sir. I have not seen the updated Okay, hold on. I I was not sent those. I'm sorry. Okay, (laughs) just hang on because we're going to play them for you and everybody right now. All right. Well, Joe, that sounded like a sponsor spot, not the rules. No, hold on. Let me press this button. This is the button with the rules. Forget it, Don. Forget it. We're just going to go without the rules. How about that? Okay. Because they confuse me anyway. I wouldn't follow them. But before we get started, can I, land. It's- can I ask a favor? Can I ask? Maybe I'd like, actually, I'd like to ask Don a favor. After the show, would you mind doing my voicemail for me? I, I think your voice is just, uh, it, it's so awesome. Funny you should ask. Uh, I'm just doing voice work now. I just started up in, in the voiceover business. So sure, I'll do yours for free. You're just started. Awesome. Don, Don just noticed he's got like a gold voice where we'd all throw ours well, away. Lance if we told had me his. that a couple of times, and I went, I should probably start voice acting. <laughs> no offense taken, yeah. Len. Don't worry about it, buddy. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm good over here. Uh, <laughs> not every week with Doug, but no. Yeah. All right. Sorry. We got Don. We got Len. We got Paula. Let's get moving. All right. Today's piece comes from a little known author named Ryan Holiday. Paula, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this guy. I, I certainly am. He's uh, been a guest on the Afford Anything podcast. Oh, braggy brag, brag, brag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Ryan is a fantastic author and, uh, as I've heard, a heck of a human being. But mm-hmm. Ryan had a recent blog post, 31 Lessons I've Learned About Money. And he walks through 31 different things that he's learned over his lifetime. And I thought at that way, Mark, as I said previously... This is uh, a great time here at the midpoint of the year to kind of do a little bit of reflection before we roll out the second half. Um, let's let's start here at the beginning. His very first point, Don, we'll start with you as our guest. Sure. He says, I've never been a person who ever reached, quote, their number. He said, you know, people say when I hit X amount of money, I'll be good. They say once I have this year's salary in the bank, I'll be good. Nobody ever seems to get that at number. We're never good. Because we move the goalposts. We, we do that to ourselves, don't we? Like we refuse happiness or reflection on how good things are. We constantly seem to live in, in, in what a coach of mine calls the gap and not the gain, all the good stuff we've done. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's really sort of sad. And I've really tried in my personal life, just make it very personal, to, to try to get past that psychological hurdle. Because as mentioned, I'm getting old. Uh, I, there has to be a point where there is enough. And, and it's, I loved this piece, by the way, uh, the, the whole piece was great because it's more about enjoying what money can do for you as opposed to the, just the pursuit of money. And I've never, even though our show's about money, I've never been a huge fan of just chasing money for the sake of money. There is, despite the fact we don't get comfortable with a the number, there needs to be a range where we finally go. That's about where I'm comfortable, and I don't need much more. Hard to do. Paula, I saw you had a post about this over a Fourth of July weekend about how mm-hmm. we, you know, we were have this big pursuit about money and how we use Fourth of July to talk about financial freedom. Yes. <laughs> all kind of, everybody shows pictures of fireworks. <laughs> By the way, you posted all that neat stuff. I just posted pictures of fireworks, like everybody else, that nobody's going to open <laughs> and watch. So, uh, uh, but but I think you're on Don's bandwagon with that one. I, well, I am, but there's, there's a, I'll add a little bit of nuance here. So, um, or, or a, a slightly different take. Um, so yes, I absolutely agree that you should never confuse the, the means for the end, right? Money is a tool that allows you to live the type of life that you want to live. And so I think that, um, into what Don was saying, you need to have a range of what type of life do I want to create for myself? And when you reach that type of life, you're like, cool, I'm good here. 
That being said, there's also a lot of joy in pursuit, right? So it's sometimes it's not about sometimes the reason that we move the goalpost is because not because of the goal itself, but because we really just enjoy pursuing a goal, like the act of pursuing a goal. And without that, we're left rudderless. And, and you see this, whether it could be a fitness goal, it could be a charitable goal, it could be a goal related to chess or poker or, um, I don't know, having the most elaborate game of fans fan theory, right? Like whatever it is, there's joy in pursuit. But I think the key there, Paula, is joy. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many people have we met where it's just more, 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 not M-O-R-E, like M-O-A-R, like more, (laughs) more, (laughs) give me more. And and this pursuit becomes overwhelming and there's no, they suck the fun out of everything because they're so worried about having more, more, more that they never really enjoy life. Right, right. It reminds me of this, uh, this phrase, plan for tomorrow, don't live in it. Uh, Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if and when you get so caught up in the more, you should never sacrifice today, right? And that doesn't mean don't save, obviously. Right. I'll be happy means, when. I'll be happy right. when is a lie. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Let you know, I was thinking about you when uh, when Don was talking earlier because you're somebody who put off retirement because that number you know, went down during the pandemic time. And I remember you're like, I think I'm just going to stick it out a little longer. And then they asked you to stay a little longer. Uh, What did you think when you read this first one about not reaching your number? What I thought was the number is always, it's it's like a, uh, it's a moving target. It's a constantly moving target. It's kind of like having that, you ever see those, uh, they they, they tie the, uh, a, a stick with a carrot hanging around you and you put on the headband. And so you're, you're walking forward and that (laughs) carrot's out there. Right. And you're chasing it and you never get to it. Um, You know, it's there is no right number. And and the thing is with life, you know, as you get older, I mean, things happen. um, There's things you cannot foresee uh, that come up and they could move that number down or it could move it up. It's just, uh, you know, I think Don hit it earlier where he was saying, you know, it's like kind of like your lifestyle or maybe it was you, Joe. I can't remember. But if you know how what kind of lifestyle you want to live, it really doesn't matter what that number is throughout life because you know you know the kind of lifestyle you want and so therefore in a way it's kind of like a constant almost i mean if if you're i think most people are uncertain and i think they have bigger goals in retirement and it's almost like they want to spend more they think they want to have all this extra money so they can spend more in retirement when in reality it's actually the opposite uh you you actually spend way less than i think uh you anticipate you're going to spend in retirement at least that's how it's been for me so far and, and it's been really cool so far, you know, now that I'm, uh, what, seven, eight, nine months into retirement. And I mean, uh, it's just been, it's great, actually. I'm, I'm like, man, I've got, Jeez. I'm doing really well is what I'm, because I've, I've spent way less than I anticipated. If, if you're not spending enough, let Doug and I come over and help you out, man. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can change that trajectory if you need it. No. That, that's only sure, that sure. No. Yeah, come on, I'll cut you. I'll cut yeah. you a check. Sure, no problem. He's just going to ignore you until you go away. <laughs> I was saying, did that sound like a nervous laugh, Don? That sounded like a nervous <laughs> laugh to me. No, like, don't yeah. come over. <laughs> but I can't Lock. say it on the air because people are listening. Lock the door, honey. Lock the door. Uh, back to back to you, Don. The second one. It's important to remember. Yeah. What once seemed like a lot of money to you? He says, when I dropped out of college to work as an assistant in Hollywood, I took a salary for thirty thousand dollars. I remember saying to myself, no joke, what am I going to do with all this money? It's pretty cool to remember that feeling. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of remember that feeling. As a matter of fact, uh, it was something I was going to mention a little later. Uh, when, when I was young, when I was a young man, I accidentally stumbled into being a stockbroker. It was totally accidental. And I was making a lot of money for the time, for the 80s. It was a lot. And uh, it comes to one of his other points. is. <laughs> I quit my job as a stockbroker to go into radio for $500 a month, but it changed my life. So, you know, money, while it felt like a lot and I never got, it wasn't until recently, literally like within the last five years that I got back to an after inflation adjustment level to what I made in 1984 as a stockbroker. Wow. Wow. Um, so that, Money is, is, again, that's why I want to come back to, the, to that whole point of not reaching the number. 
We're not going to be, and this is the point of the article, we're not going to be really happy until we stop making the pursuit of money the goal and the, the, the excitement about the money the impetus for doing this. Yeah, and, I, and I'm wondering, Len, what's the core of his point here about $30,000 being a lot of money when he's young and remembering that? Well, I, I think the core that, I, that I'm taking away right now from Don is I should have been a stockbroker when I, when I graduated. That's what I, that's <laughs> that's, what I got that's, so that's far from that. Away. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, I've no, tried but, to get my daughter to be a financial advisor because all the advisors I know are making huge money and she's like teaching. What? What's she thinking? You know, I, I think basically what he's, you know, he making $30,000 and, you know, he thinks that was really great. I, I'm wondering if that's because, and I'm not sure what year that was that he was making 30000 but maybe that was because his um, wants were a lot less and he was living within his paycheck and, and whatever his wants were at the time, he had enough discretionary income left over to uh, feel like he was wealthy. He felt comfortable. And that's probably because of his, you know, discretionary spending uh, desires. They, they were lower. I'm sure if he was, you know, looking for, you know, he wanted to drive a Lamborghini and live in this huge mansion right off the bat, he, you know, he'd think he was poor. But I think a lot of it had to do with his attitude about discretionary spending. That feels very true to me, Len. When I was really bad with money, I found that it didn't, you know, the big lie was, was if I just make more, my life will be better. And if, you know, if I made 80, I would have spent 100. If I made 100, I would have spent 120. Made 120, I would have spent 140. And it was just, you can't out earn your bad money habits. Yes. Li- lifestyle inflation, they call it, right? I yeah. mean, your salary goes up and so your lifestyle goes up. And you'll never win with that. You'll never win. And yet his next point here, Paul, is Seneca said poverty. Imagine Ryan Holiday c- quoting Seneca. Isn't that weird? <laughs> just, I'm sorry. For people who don't know Ryan Holiday, that's what Ryan Holiday does, is quote yeah, Seneca. He's, he's well known for his stoicism. Yes. Uh, it was wanting more. He wasn't talking about poor people. He's talking about rich people. He's talking about people who are insatiable. Rich is having enough. I guess he's, you're right. He's pounding that point home. Yeah, you know, but I think there's some, there's, again, there's a little bit of nuance here. So, like, when Ryan Holiday and I uh, are roughly around the same age, um, and so if he was making 30 grand right out of, right out of undergrad adjusted for inflation, that would be probably around 40 grand today. And so you graduated yes, last week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> say, aren't the price of eggs 40 I, grand? Technically, actually, I did graduate last month. <laughs> you actually, you can, you see right back there. It's actually on camera. See that envelope that's right above my stove. Oh, that's my diploma. Oh. Yeah. So that looks like a diploma envelope. That's, yeah, that's a di- that's my diploma. I literally haven't opened the envelope yet. I'm I not just, sure the yeah. fire marshal would approve of that flammable <laughs> item being near your stove. Show so much she thinks about that paper yeah. right there. Let's put it on the stove. <laughs> you know, I don't think Stacy Johnson would be impressed this with is- that. <laughs> oh, Stacy Johnson, who showed up with his Emmys done conspicuously in the background behind him, just happened to be there. Uh huh. <laughs> Actually, it's funny. Jill Schlesinger did the same thing. So they, they, they apparently are. They apparently are proud of those things. I don't know. Oh, and, and, and of course, none of us would be. I know. Should if I, I got an Emmy, would I care? No, Should I bring no. my unop- my unopened envelope from the stove over to the to hold it into the, the frame? <laughs> so somewhere there, Paula, we missed the point. What was the point? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So on on one hand, um, Ryan Holiday is uh, you know. His wants increased, right? At that point, he was probably living, I'm, I'm going to guess he was probably living in a small apartment with a bunch of roommates. Uh, today, he lives on a farm, right? And a farm is much more expensive to maintain with, you know, with all the land and the, the property taxes and everything like that. Um, back then, he didn't have any kids, right? Today, he has two kids. So wants change, lifestyle changes. Um, level of responsibility or number of dependents changes. I don't want to finger wag about lifestyle inflation because expecting somebody to live, um, you know, with like five roommates in a tiny apartment for the rest of their life, including like, um, it's it just, you don't, you don't want to main, I mean, nobody, I wants, I, to live, nobody just, wants to live like that for their, in, in any, yeah. but, but everybody has a, a, a lifestyle with which they feel comfortable. And that should be what you, you work toward is the lifestyle that's right for me. That may be one 
excuse me, that requires a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But it may not. Isn't this isn't this Seneca thing then? I mean, isn't it isn't it about asking yourself whether I, whether I really do want this, Paula? Yeah, I think I think it's about being happy with what you have, you know, um, and appreciating what you have. I, I mean, I think that's kind of like the, you know, I, I think basically the Seneca quote is trying to say that if you don't learn that skill set, the skill set of saying whatever I have is good. Um, then that lack of skill will will stay with you, will infect your level of happiness no matter what, or your level of satisfaction no matter what your external circumstances. You still seem uncomfortable with that, though. Yeah, you know, I uh, I just think that it's also, it's a little oversimplified, right? Um, because number one, there's there's a certain level that's just unacceptable, right? And I think that, that anyone living at a very, an, an extreme level of this is just not an acceptable lifestyle um, shouldn't be asked to be satisfied with it, right? There are certain circumstances that are simply untenable. And I also think that there's an and here. You know, if you have a circumstance that is tenable and, you know, you can simultaneously be satisfied with it and also strive for more in part because you love uh, the game, right? And you love the, the joy of pursuit, as we talked about earlier. So I think there's, there are several asterisks and a few ands to be added. The last one I want to point to before I set you guys loose on this one is this, uh, a little bit further down the piece. He says, pick the low-hanging fruit. I've had to remind Daily Stoic employees several times to be sure to sign up for their 401k matching we offer. I've left money for too long in checking accounts when the easiest of transfers would have significantly increased the interest I was earning. Don't get overwhelmed by the whole of life, the Stoics would say. Do easy things first. I think about that. What's funny, guys, is I immediately think of something that's low-hanging fruit that I'm not doing. And I'm wondering, what's the low-hanging fruit in your life, if you don't mind sharing that with our, with our stacker audience, that you're like, man, I should be doing that, but I'm not. Don, do you got one? Not anymore. I think I had a, uh, for a long time when I didn't take advantage, uh, when it was more important to have the money to pay the bills than it was to put the money away in the 401k when I had an employer and get that free match. It's like, it's like w- w- seeing a Benjamin on the ground and not, not grabbing my Benjamin and putting it yeah. in. You know, you can't leave money just laying around. But anymore, I don't think I leave money laying around. I think I may do a few things that aren't great with money just out of, sheer boredom or the need to just do something with my money but uh the the low-hanging fruit when you're younger is is often elusive and it's not very obvious it's one of the reasons why i think it would be such a great idea if it was just the norm to sign everybody up at an employer for the 401k that it, it was done it was the default you didn't you only the choice you had would be to opt out opt in is what you get that would eliminate a lot of this low hanging fruit for uh, for many of the younger folks out there working their tails off toward a retirement. Really, what's the ultimate goal of all this saving and investing we do? It's retirement. Live more. You, you know, and it's, it's funny that you that you even bring that up because you've seen the studies like like I have that uh, that people are likely to keep saving if it's opt out instead of opt in people mm-hmm. more more people stay with it very few people actually opt out um mine is actually even simpler than that my low-hanging fruit is i've got too many of those tv subscription services and i only have one set of eyes and I, and, and i've got like apple tv disney plus uh netflix um and, and i was reminded of that because i love the tour de france and i signed up for peacock at the start of this month at a rate of like another five dollars a month and I, and I'm and the you know the trick is if it matters to you if it really the money matters but, but you this just is the quit thing. them you yes. quit them and then you sign up again well that's exactly it my cousin does that very well he signs up for one he does it and i know that while i'm busy with the tour de france don i'm not going to be watching disney plus yeah so why the hell do i still have it and yet it's i felt like ryan was talking to me with that one Lindy, you got one you know, I did, um, like Don, as you get older, I think usually you're financially responsible. You don't have any low-hanging fruit. But I, I did uh, about a year ago, and I think most people can, this will affect most people today still, I believe. Uh, it is, uh, 
your interest, if you've got a lot of money in a, a high interest saving, quote, high interest savings account or just a checking account or a not a high interest savings account, uh, take that money out and put it in an, a CD or a money market or even better, a treasury bill because it is paying uh, so much more right now. And I mean, you're, you're, throwing, you're, you're throwing money away. Uh, by leaving it in a bank right now. I mean, if I may banks- just insert something, Len, uh, to that point, we on the show last week, I went to my Schwab account on the air on the show and looked up their uh, brokered CD rates. I could get a one year brokered CD from Schwab for 5.45%. So I went to Bank of America and typed in all my stuff and to see what they'd give me on a five or on a one year CD. Mm-hmm. 0.03%. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Well, I, it was a Bank of America CD at Schwab five and five point four five versus point zero zero three. If you go into the bank, there's well, some and, hanging for you. And I'm the you know I'm actually a bigger fan of, rather than CDs and money markets is, is Treasury bills right now because uh, they're paying uh, even more than the CDs. And the other beauty of the of the Treasury bills, and when I say a bill, I mean less than uh, one year or less. 26 weeks, 17 week, 13 week, eight and four weeks. Uh, you do that. Uh, it's tax free at the state level. So you're only charged federal tax. So that gives you even higher uh, real interest rate when you think about it. And because it's the federal government, I mean, it's, nothing is safer than the federal government. If, you, if you've got some sort of paper thing like that, uh, it's even safer than a bank. Um, and it's not treasure bills are not subject to gating fees and they're not subject to crisis fees. They can shut down a money market and you might you might not even be able to pull that money out of your money market in a crisis. That's true. not true for a T bill. So, I mean, that's why right now I'm, I'm a huge fan of T bills for savings accounts. So. Well, there's some low hanging fruit, Paula, low hanging fruit in your life right now. I definitely have too much money sitting in checking accounts for sure. hundred percent. Um, so, so yeah, it looks like I should be buying up some tea bills. Yeah. Too busy, uh, getting that diploma you're trying to burn on that stove. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> did you say, did, did you say checking accounts, plural? Yes. Like, uh, business and personal both. Oh, all right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, well, she just likes visiting banks. I have to, <laughs> that's right. I love that bank. I love that bank. <laughs> Loves those people. Now, if only they'd love her back. There, there's, there's Paula's love life with banks right there. Uh, let's let's do uh, one quick one around before we go to the break, guys. Uh, what's one on this list that you really like, Paula? I'd say um, the one about acceptance. Acceptance is a difficult thing, but it's an important skill as you become successful. Um, accept that a certain amount of your investments will fail, that mistakes will cost you, that there will be fees, um, that you will have to pay taxes. Right. Uh, so accept all of those things that are, are, you know, some people just get very caught up in um, or let be thorns in their side. I love this quote, Paul. I don't remember who I heard it from, but but the quote was around. We got to stop being so egotistical and thinking we're going to get it right all the time. Just realize we don't mm. get it right all the time and have the bravery to fail forward and 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 accept that we're not perfect and change it quickly. You mm. know, I like. The courage to fail. Yeah, I, like that. I thought I'm writing that down. Actually, I, I thought that was that was uh, uh, super super advice. I wish I could remember the source. Uh, uh, Len, which one do you like? Well, one off the top, I, I really like the one about don't compare yourself to other people. I think a lot of a lot of us do that at times. It's just natural. You'll see somebody and they're doing really well, and you'll be like, you know, and it'll 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 bring you down a little bit. Um, or you'll feel, feel like you're behind because you've done something wrong. And that's just not, you know, it's just, you're, don't do that. It, it's not, um, you worry about yourself and that's the only thing that's important and that you're meeting your goals and you're doing what you need to do to be happy. I think, uh, that one stuck out to me. I do it all the time, Len. And it truly is, as mom says, the thief of joy. It truly is. It yep. sucks the fun out of everything. Whenever yep. you do that, Don, uh, before we go to the break, which one's yours? Yeah. When it comes to managing money, I think the most difficult thing people face is their emotion. And so I'm going to go with the discipline is hard. Oh, yeah. Your emotions will make some of the worst decisions you will ever make financially if you let them. And that's why that idea of automation that he refers to, 
Automate everything. Make it a rule. Make it a habit. Make it, it rebalance your portfolio once a year. Know what you, you, how you need to invest, what your risk tolerance is, and never deviate from that unless your tolerances or needs change. Find a way to create disciplines that are automatic behaviors so that you can control that stupid little lizard brain of yours that says, <laughs> ah, the world is dead. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because when he, when he wrote that, and I love that one too, by the way, uh, I just think that automation makes it so I can be a little less disciplined and I'll still be okay. If it's automated, I'm not going to mess with that. Then, then I'm going to get emotional in other areas. Well, that's what I say. Save your emotions. Yeah. Get them out of the money. Save them for your family. That's right. Save them for that horrible Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. 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 <laughs> We're taking Fourth of July pictures. Right. Of fireworks <laughs> that no one wants to see. Ever. Hey, I sent them to everybody. And then I saw that all over the internet. Nobody's going to open up and watch your your four hundred one k fireworks. I felt, I, I felt like I felt like that dude from the progressive commercial, Len, where you're becoming your dad. And I'm like, oh, let's send these to the family. These will be boring yeah. as. F <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow! I'm I'm horrible. Uh, all right. Welcome to the club. At the halfway at the halfway mark of I got to start wearing dark socks up to my up to my knees now with my shorts. <laughs> That's going to be next. Uh, Sandals. At the at the halfway mark of every show, if you're brand new to Stacky Benjamins, we have this uh, Friday competition uh, between our frequent contributors Paula Pant, Len Penzo, and OG Don. You are playing on Team OG today, which means. <sighs> You have some good news and some bad news about this year-long competition. Which one would you like oh, first? Oh, I always prefer the bad news. Get it out of the way. Well, the bad news is, even though Team OG has won the past two years in a row and currently has the dollar store trophy mounted right above where he uh, usually sits when he's on well, the With show. his Emmys. Yes. Uh, well, well, that is his version. That's our version of the Emmy. <laughs> Nobody would consider us for an Emmy, so we just have the dollar store I won trivia trophy. Uh, so the bad news is uh, you and OG are in last place with seven points. But the good news is... That's where I figured I'd be. That's uh, that, <laughs> The good news, though, Don, though, is that that means you get to guess last. Because Paula Pant is in a really weird place. She's guessing second because she's in second place. I don't know how the hell that happened. I don't know what's wrong in the universe, but Paula's in second. And then Len, two points ahead with 10. So Len has 10, Paula has eight, OG has seven. Len, you're going to guess first, but we need some trivia to make that happen. And this is where we swing it back to Doug. Doug, what are we talking about this week, man? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And I think it's time to tighten the belt, and make some tough cutbacks around here. My bowling budget's out of control. But, you know, it, it, it puts a strain on the wallet when you have a natural gift for knocking things over and you love pitchers of beer. So it's time to trade one activity for another and head to the park. Less to knock over and the cops kind of frown on beers in public. That keeps the wallet happy. Speaking of parks, did you know there are a boatload of them in every city, especially NYC? NYC, wait, what does that stand for? Non-youth? culture maybe <laughs> oh no that's that's len's house uh, oh it's uh it's new york city that's right that's right it's a good one it kind of rolls rolls right off the tongue i'm gonna start using that the most well-known park of course just might be central park where the squirrels probably do hardcore parkour you could play a mean game of hide and seek in this urban oasis squarely in the center of manhattan as it spans a whopping 843 acres which is the equivalent to 646 football fields the park has seven bodies of water, including several lakes and ponds, and welcomes around 42 million visitors each year. People always talk about Central Park. After all, it's the most famous and most visited. But NYC, see, it just rolls right off the tongue. It's brilliant. Has more than 1,700 <laughs> parks, playgrounds, and recreational facilities. So my question is, where does Central Park fall in the ranking of the largest parks in New York City? I'll be back right after I grease up some acorns and watch the squirrels bat them around. We'll see how they adapt to the challenge. I just dug so easily, easily amused. And uh, NYC, they, they, they should adopt that, Doug. That could become a thing. 
They keep calling it that. T-shirts. I see a whole marketing. Imagine campaign. what they could do with that. All right, uh, Mr. Penzo, uh, Central Park. Um, and is by this the way, a trick Doug, question. When, what when is? Said, did you? When, when Doug said bodies of water, I thought he was going to say bodies. Central Park has a few there bodies. Are seven bodies <laughs> of water. Of water. <laughs> Buried. Which, which could also be yeah. appropriate. What, but. Did, is the question, where does it rank in the city of New York City in terms of area, in all of, size? In all, it, They've got seven. In acreage? In all of New York City, where does it fall in terms of acreage? In terms of They've got s- number of parks, where does it rank? Is it? They've got 1,700 parks. Where does it rank in size? In New York City. Yes, the, yes, Len. <laughs> My God. Also known as NYC. NYC. Well, this yeah, NYC. Is, uh, I mean, I, I, I used, I could have swore it was the biggest freaking park in New York City. I mean, I, I that's yeah, why I'm wondering. Well, is this give us a, Brooklyn, you got the Bronx, you got. Uh, give us an answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's is it a trick a question, question I'm going to kick my, I'm going to kick myself. I'm going to kick myself if, if it's not number one. Uh, but it's got to be a trick question. So I am going to say, I'm going to say four. He says fourth largest park. Paula, what do you think? Hmm. I, I mean, so it's definitely not number one. Prospect Park is larger. Uh, there's a park that's up in the Bronx that is larger. I do think he's very close. Um, I think, uh, man. So, so what's going through my head right now is You're that a on local. one hand, you should know this. You should know this. Yeah, no. So, what's going through my head right now really is I, I, I honestly think that the answer is like three. It's probably number three, four, five, somewhere in there. So, Len, you might be like nose on the money, or I, if not, then you might be like I think one or two spots off. So you're going to Chelsea uh, running me? Yeah, we got that. Well, well, no, but here's the problem: is I'm guessing second. So if I were to guess, you guessed four, right? Um, so I don't want to guess too close to you and get sandwiched in. Isn't Paula getting serious now that she's in second place? I mean, she's this is like new territory. She's really getting very strategic here. And that now, nice Yeah, atrocious. she actually cares. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I won the If trophy, so, I want to play more I'd, seriously. Is, I'd put it on the stove next to my diploma, <laughs> it right? Is, it is full of jelly beans. <laughs> I'm going to guess, just to allow some, some birth, I'm going to guess <laughs> some birth. eight. I beg your pardon? Eight. <laughs> B-E-R-T-H, birth. Oh, I see. Oh, <laughs> oh. yeah. <laughs> Don, you got four and you've got eight. You, know, you got a field goal it's there. It's really interesting that this question came up because my daughter just recently moved to Brooklyn. And we were talking about Prospect Park, where she's really close, and she goes there all the time. And I said, isn't Central Park the biggest? She goes, no. How many bodies are in Prospect Park? (laughs) Probably a lot. Uh, But the one in the Bronx, which I think is Van Cor... I don't know. She Mm -hmm. said there's one in the Bronx that's bigger, Prospect, and then Central. Since she just told me this three days ago, I'm going to go with three. Don takes the under. We got three. We got four. I'm pretty sure on this one because you know I trust my daughter. She's a teacher, and we got eight. I'd love to tell you right, Don, but um, we're going to make you wait. We'll be right back. <gasps> Len, you kick this off by thinking it might be the biggest. I think based on what Paula and Don both said, you, you're happy you didn't go with one. Well, I'm a I'm a Southern California. I, I had no idea. I thought it was the biggest park in New York City. I never even heard of Prospect Park. So yeah, I, this is this is a surprise. I learned something today. Yes. And P- Paula feeling good up there around eight. No, I think Don has it. I think Prospect, then Van Cortland. I uh, no number one Van Cortland, number two Prospect. I think number three Central. I think that's that sounds right. All right. Well, uh, and Don, sir, how I, mad I, are you going to get at your daughter if 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 you blow this? question um not at all <laughs> that, that's very because nice. i get nothing if i blow this question i lose nothing i gain nothing except for the og's undying love which i haven't felt expressed so what do i know oh you're not yeah, alone for the there. record don i'm gonna be mad at your daughter if you're correct so <laughs> okay well, then, that's better there we go all right uh doug who's writing this thing 
Hey there, stackers. I'm wildlife enthusiast and outdoor referee, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And I am sharing trivia on the most visited and talked about park in New York, Central Park. The park covers close to 843 acres and is about 2.6 miles in length as the crow flies, but has 58 miles of pedestrian paths. Sure, it's popular with tourists and is in lots of TVs and movies, but my question was, where does it fall in the ranking of the largest parks in New York City? Well, Paula was off by three, Don was off by two, and Len was off by just one. It's actually the fifth largest park in New York City. For those of you who are interested at home, Pelham Bay Park is actually the largest at 2,700 acres. The Pelham Green Bay's Belt, a park? Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx, 2,772 acres. Greenbelt, Staten Island is two. Van Cortland is 1,150, roughly. Flushing Meadow, now actually I think it's Fresh Kills Park is going to be four at 2,200 acres. And then Central Park. So they got a lot of land. Oh. But most people like Len only think, when you say New York City, you think of Manhattan. You don't think about all the other boroughs. What? So, yeah, Paula. Wow. I the can't believe local, it. you were the furthest off proving <laughs> I, how much you struggle at this game. I literally said that I don't want to guess five. <laughs> I was like, you're letting guess four, so I don't want to guess five. That's, that's too close. <laughs> how many weeks in a row, Paula? God, we said whatever you think, you should do the opposite. We've been saying wow. that. Wow. I literally Len, said. <laughs> Len, congratulations, <I> <laughs> OG. You're welcome. <laughs> right. um, Don, Paula, I, by I'm, the way, I'm, in, I'm, I'm good with your daughter again, Don. We're, we're okay, I knew you would be. <laughs> all, yeah. all is right in the world. Yes. Uh, by the way, Paula, Prospect Park, second biggest park in Brooklyn. Not even the biggest park in Brooklyn. <gasps> Whoa. Wow. Whoa. It doesn't make the top 10. 526 list, acres, at... second behind Marine yeah. Park. Uh, hmm. Wow. Yes. Boy, was she Boy, wrong. I feel stupid. She That's really wrong. crazy. God. I thought I thought it was by far the biggest park. That's amazing. Well, now, now, yeah, and yet you were right. So <laughs> yes, I was. Well, <laughs> sometimes that happens, Don. <laughs> no, all of these humble brag. All of our stackers yeah. got something to talk about around the water cooler of the virtual Zoom call uh, today. Hey, uh, time for the second half of the show, and the second half is brought to you by DepositAccounts.com. Don, you know what happens when you go to DepositAccounts.com? You deposit stuff in your account? You can, and you probably, <laughs> before you do that, you should look at all the different deposit accounts and decide if they're worth it or not. Because to your point, you walk into a Bank of America branch, they don't pay anything. And as we record no. this slightly before you hear it, savings accounts in America, national average is paying 0.41%. Depositaccounts.com tells me that top 1% average is 4.45%. CDs? Uh, one year CD top one percent paying five point four one national average three point four five. Of course, by the time this comes out, those numbers are different. But you know where you go to find out. Go to depositaccounts dot com. Oh, that's where you go. Yes, and time for the second half. Let's <laughs> let's take this piece and let's put that aside. People can go and uh, visit uh, our show notes and then Ryan Holiday's site to read more of his 31 things but here at the midway point of the year and thinking back over your life let's talk about uh some some lessons learned if you were going to write your own 31 lessons paula what would be at the top of that list who i would say focus on earning focus on income um especially at the beginning of your career well i mean i i at all points in your career. Um, is this what you tell a younger you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, because I think that there are two traps that people can fall into. One is the assumption that it's all about frugality. And to quote you, Joe, you can't shrink your way to greatness, right? You can, you can only frugal down so much, um, at, after which point you really hit diminishing returns. So focus on earning, focus on income. And the other trap that people can fall into is they get so caught up in investing and like wanting to really micro, you know, like they're, they're thinking all the time about like, how do I optimize my investments without realizing that your contributions are the single biggest determinant of the success of your portfolio. And if you don't have a high enough income, you simply can't make big contributions. You're curtailed in that. And that should be pretty exciting, by the way, for people listening to this. If you're in your 20s or in your early 30s and you're worried about, I don't know enough about investing, that's okay. 
it, learn more about how to shovel more money in right now and and be comfortable getting comfortable with investing over time. You don't got to be great at it now, Paula. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Len, Len, how about you? What's uh, what's one you tell a younger version of yourself? Um, wow. Well, th- th- there's one I learned the hard way. I'm struggling and- to remember that far back, Joe. <laughs> 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 um, uh, the, the one I learned the hard way is uh, a good deal. When you're making a deal with somebody else and you're bargaining or going back and forth negotiating, a, a good deal is when both people walk away from the deal happy. Um, because if you, let's say you over negotiate and you maybe bully somebody into making a deal they don't want to, that can come back to bite you in the end. And I'll give a quick example. This happened to me uh, oh, <laughs> quite, a, quite a while ago. Uh, I bought, bought, bought my first house and I had him put in a, a uh, and I was tight on money. And uh, there was a new guy, uh, uh, one of the irrigation people that came by, I got an estimate from, he was new. I found out he was new, so I knew he was desperate. And I actually got him to agree to a price that was ridiculously cheap. He just wanted the job to get, you know, to get some money, and I was just trying to get things as cheap as possible. Well, you know what? I paid for it at the end because to make the price work, he used substandard parts. For the next three or four years, the pipes in my yard were, would burst because he used such thin piping. And that's because I had forced him down to a price that was so low that um, you know it was detrimental to me as well. He got his money, but in the end, I was the one that paid. You know, I was laughing at first, he was laughing at the end. So you know, make sure when you're dealing and negotiating, you, know, it's, don't, you, know, you want both people to be happy. Don't try to take over an advantage of somebody. It's it's interesting. You say I'm in a negotiation right now, and I'm actually giving the person on the other side. They're a young person, Len, and they're giving me too much. Well, now, but here's what I want to do. I want to pay you more than that. I want to give you more than that because I know that even though they think they're going to be happy now, <laughs> I know enough about life to know that three weeks from now they're not going to be as happy, and I'm not going to get the productivity that I hope for. So, yeah, great, great lesson, Don. Well, g- given the fact that I've had like you know, Len Penzo years to learn. Uh, <laughs> the thing that I've learned is um, embrace your very human flexibility ability. The fact that we have a, an incredible ability to be flexible in our lives and everything is not the end of the world. You do not have to live the lifestyle you think you have to live when you have to live it. You need to be flexible because the more flexible you are, the less disappointed you'll be, the more you'll be able to enjoy your situation, no matter what direction it takes. And I think this is particularly prevalent for the day when you finally you've saved all that money and you're going into retirement. I really believe you can enjoy a better life at any phase if you have flexibility. I'll give you an example. If you're in a year. You're, you're earning money, but you're, you you got no bonuses. Your second job fell through. You don't have extra money. You become more, as Paula said, frugal during that period of time. The next year, you get a raise at work. Now you're making more money. You're putting a little more away. But now you use that flexibility to reward your frugality with a little bit more stuff that next year. You enjoy your life better. And so it's like uh, the puppy downstairs. You know, when the puppy does well, I reward the puppy. And if I made it through a bad time, I reward myself for making it through that bad time. And I think that'll make it easier the next bad time. I love how uh, our mutual friend Paul Merriman has worked that into his life where he he um, when he was on Stacking Benjamins was talking about how he, uh, you know, in years when his portfolio does really well, they will take the big trip. In years mm-hmm. when it doesn't do really well, they will visit the Pacific Northwest where he lives because there's plenty of beautiful stuff locally. And, and, and he will be very flexible about what his plans are just based on life and what happens around you. And, and so he's, he's happy no matter what the market does. But, but also, it's, it's, it's built, right into, built right into his life. And I also feel like, Paula, when you and I are answering questions on Afford Anything, how many times have we told your afford anything community that too many people solve for optimization, not enough people solve for flexibility? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And um, there's a great quote from JL Collins where he says, flexibility is the only true security. Right. Yeah. So that flexibility, that adaptability 
is, and it, it ties in with beautifully with Ryan Holiday's, uh, you know, stoicism sure. philosophy, well, it, right? Like, yeah, flexibility slash stoicism, uh, guided by stoicism, is the ability to be um, content no matter what. Well, and, and, and you know, Len, I would think, I mean, you work your whole career with engineers, and I, I found that when I was a financial planner, this was a mistake that engineers make very often. They, they're so concerned with optimization that they forget the flexibility needs to be part of the plan. Yeah, you know, um, it, I think what a lot of people forget is life is meant for living and money is a means to an end. And um, sometimes people forget that and it's okay to spend that money uh, when, you've, when you've got it. I mean, it, it's just, um, I, I know people that will, they'll save and they'll never spend and they're miserable. I mean, it's, it's okay to go out there and spend that money when you've got it and, and plan for that money. Um, but, but, uh, it's important to make sure that you're not focused so much on just, uh, saving and making money and putting it away. I mean, go ahead and, and it's okay to spend money. That's a, it's a great point. And, and Don singing off of your song sheet that this is just a fuel, you know, my, um, my contribution to this, I would tell my younger person, my younger self to find mentors sooner. Like when I've discovered mentorship. And the fact yeah. that there are people that have walked this road before me, I was way too interested when I was young in, in learning everything by myself. And I was very stubborn. I'm like, nope, the fun is in learning it myself. Well, I made a bunch of stupid mistakes that I could have avoided if I found mentorship way, way, way sooner. Like, don't, 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 don't do that. Uh, Doug, let's bring you here in at the end. What's one you tell your younger self? If you think you got a problem that you can solve with money, you don't have a problem. Meaning money's the easy, quick not not best answer. Yeah, I mean, so and I mean, when I, when I was a leader of uh, large teams, I also remember maybe the converse or inverse of that, which is ain't no problem like a people problem. Those are far more difficult to solve. The complexities of the human mind and the and and emotions and all of the the context that goes with interpersonal challenges. Those are real problems, and those really require a lot of challenges to solve. Money problems. As stressful as they can be, believe it or not, there are, there's almost always an answer to solve those kinds of problems. But people problems are far, far more difficult. So don't focus on the money one so much. It's funny when you talk about people problems, too. I, f I feel like so many times people call, you know, personal interaction is the, quote, soft skills. I don't think there's anything soft about it. Like people, oh God, no. people that can handle the, quote, soft skills are going to navigate life so much easier. Just so, so, so Amen. much easier. Well, I'm so glad that we had this conversation. I hope that this helps kickstart our Stacker community for the second half of the year. You got so much stuff that we could do, and I'm just looking forward to see what people create uh, here, here, and the next uh, several months. So let's go get things done. And to help them get things done, we have uh, a blog and a couple podcasts that can help you get there. First of all, they can go to lempenzo.com where they will find Mr. Penzo what? You know, it's, it's kind of a corollary to what we're talking about today. We're at lenpenzo.com. We're talking about uh, does money buy happiness and how you can, uh, you know, how you can go about helping you buy happiness, at least to some degree. So uh, at least, stop at on least by. It's an interesting it. conversation going on. Uh, always, that? always an interesting conversation. I said, well, if you can't buy happiness, <laughs> at least you can put a down payment on it. Of course. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. leveraging your way to happiness that's, that's right uh dom will have our guest of honor go last so let's turn to Ms. pant paula pant what's happening at afford anything that will help us the second half of the year oh on the afford anything podcast will you and i joe answer questions that come from our community um so that and and we have started going on youtube with video scary um scary right Right. So you, so actually today we, we were just kind of going through processing. So basically if you go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash afford anything, um, we're putting a lot of attention there. We're, we've just started. So, you know, moderate your expectations <laughs> accordingly. Um, but we have, we have just begun putting actual videos on YouTube. Um, and that's something that we're only going to be continuing to do further and further. So uh, check out our YouTube channel subscribe to it and uh you'll be able to see my and joe's face 
as we as we happily answer your questions. Yes. Mr. McDonald, what's going on at Talking Real Money? You'll be glad to know that we've pulled our videos. We are no longer doing <laughs> videos on YouTube, so you won't have to suffer through our faces. But in the interim, I've redone TalkingRealMoney.com. It's a lot easier to navigate. Tons of great information. We now have buckets of great articles that I've written that we've gotten from some of the smart people at uh, Dimensional Funds and Vanguard and you know, a lot of really great people around the country. We've got all of our podcasts. We're now up to online. We just passed 1,200 podcasts. They're all there. And of course, you know, on I, I take uh, we, Tom and I take your questions. We talk about the sensible, straightforward, simple ways to build wealth so that you can enjoy a really nice, comfortable, flexible retirement. They're always they're always fun, entertaining, but also, man, I get so much out of your shows every time I listen to you and Tom. There's a great back and forth from two guys that have been there, like people trying to do things. And you guys have I think you guys have seen every scam out there. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I, lo I literally believe that. I mean, from doing a talk show about money since 88 and I did it six days a week in the early days, five hours a day. We got to call um, you Mr. Ramsey. I heard wow. a lot of stuff. I did Ramsey before Ramsey was Ramsey. <laughs> I think that's a good place to end it. And we will, by the way, we will link to Talking Real Money. It, well, if you just pause and you put in the search, Talking Real Money, put in Afford Anything, subscribe to those shows, uh, and then head to LemPenzo.com and then come back, then I think uh, you're good. But we'll have links to everybody's stuff at uh, our show notes page at StackingBenjamins.com. That's it for this week. Hope everybody has a great weekend. We always finish it up by asking mom's neighbor, Doug, Doug, what should we have learned today? Well, Joe first, take some advice from our panel and take the time to learn what it is about money that's really important to you because that knowledge is priceless. Second, take it from Don McDonald. Don't overlook the obvious. Sometimes you just need to grab your Benjamin when you see it laying on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but the big lesson? Peanut butter and bacon attract way more than squirrels. Turns out there is much bigger wildlife at the park. Bonus, I learned a valuable life lesson, and I got in a good long-distance sprint. <laughs> Thanks to Don McDonald for hanging out with us today. Oh, I can wait for Are the Are you the guy you in the alligator ahead. video? <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, it's, that's true. I have seen a family of raccoons at the park. They looked very well-fed. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Thanks to Don McDonald for hanging out with us today. You'll find Don's show talking real money wherever you're listening right now. Thanks to Paula Pant for joining us today. You can find Paula's podcast, Afford Anything, at affordanything.com or, like I said, where you're listening to me right now. But most importantly, thanks to Len Penzo for joining us today. You can find Len at lenpenzo.com slash yes, money does buy happiness. You know, Joe, this part of the credits is so important to me, I had to go put on my favorite shirt. Let's do this. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Joe Salcihai with help from me, Doc G from the Earn and Invest Podcast, and Lacey Langford from the Military Money Show. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show.
You know, Don, with you being on the radio and Len, you being uh, the leader of a band um, and, <laughs> and Paula's uh, deep knowledge of, uh, of um, you know, anything cultural. Uh, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> that no one ever. <laughs> I was just thinking we should talk about music, about maybe some bands that you guys like. And the re- part of the reason I bring it up is Don, with you on the radio, and then and then yeah. I just happened to have a song playing from a band, and uh, Doug was like, what is that playing? And I played it for Doug, and that's a band he'd never heard of before that ended up... Uh, Talking about Duran Jones? Duran Jones. Oh, God. So that was that album was unbelievable, but then I went and listened to his two subsequent albums, and he, and he like, changed genres. He does. And didn't like it as much, but that album where he kind of goes late 60s soul kind of mid-60s soul fantastic fabulous music len i think you'd really like this duran jones i'll have to check it out how long have they been around len, what's a band that man, i don't know but, well that album joe that i loved uh was from 2018 okay yeah uh and then he's got a couple newer than len, that. what's a band that our stackers might really like that they've never heard of that they can go check out gosh i you know what i you're asking an old guy about about bands that uh, New, you know, probably younger people. <laughs> Listen to, I, you know, one of the, it's kind of a relative, a pretty new band. And my daughter got me into them actually that uh, I remember I went and saw them. Uh, I saw them in concert uh, just a, in October. Uh, and they're one of my favorites now is uh, bad sons. I love bad sons. So um, bad, that's, sons. Uh, bad sons. I would uh, highly recommend them. They've been around since 2014, I think. So uh, it really has an eighties, vibe to 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 them um which is maybe why i like them so much but uh yeah bad sons i do like bands that have a retro vibe i mean i think that's why i liked amy winehouse so much um uh, back then was because just her her ability to i don't know have some respect for history while at the same time making a sound that was totally new was mm-hmm. just you know just blew me away uh mm-hmm. uh uh don I know you weren't doing music on the radio, but there must be. Actually, I did a stint on FM. Did but you? Not long. There's yeah, got to be some obscure band then that you know from any oh, time gosh, frame I... that, that that didn't get the love that they should have. Oh, there's so many of them. The the Canterbury bands from England in the 70s, the 60s and the 70s, like uh, the uh, 60s and the North, 60s and the 70s, <laughs> the 60s, 70s. Uh, these were these were guys who just scratched. Uh, little lines in the pavement of Rome. You know, uh, anyway, uh, the the uh, a band called Hatfield in the North and uh, one called Caravan that were very obscure, but a couple I like that are new. Hatfield, Ur- wait a minute, is it Hatfield North? Hatfield and the North. And the North. And they're out of England. Out of, they're oh, Canterbury they bands. Yeah. Kind of obscure stuff, but good. But today, I really, the couple bands, the, there was a big t-shirt thing on Ted Lasso where uh, the, the writer wore a Midlake t-shirt. Midlake is a tremendous band. I don't even know. They're out of Texas, and it's a very sophisticated 70s prog rock kind of sound. Oh, cool. Uh, So they're very good. I like them a lot. Uh, Another another Texas band that I like that, uh, I don't know, a lot of people might know is, uh, uh, and I'm going to mess up this name, uh, and people are going to shout at their device. Is it pronounced uh, Krangbin? Krangbin? Karangbin. Karangbin. Yeah. A band that does yeah. Texas Sun. And I can yeah. never, I can never, if you guys haven't heard the song Texas Sun, I mean, that's, that's a few years old now, but, but I'm just great out. Texas, Texas. Infused. You'll never spell Karangbin. Yeah. By the, way. by the way, that's why I'm looking up Texas Sun. Yeah. It's K H R U. Yeah. So there we go. A N G B I N. Karangbin. Krangbin. All right, Paula. Sounds very Nordic. Paula's going to say there's this person nobody's heard of called Taylor. Swift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm actually a big fan of EDM music. Good. Um, there we go. And so uh, as I'm I'm looking through my Spotify recently played right now. A couple that I recommend: Sin Cole, S Y N C O L E, Sin Cole. Um, they just put out a a new. They released a new single called Lovely Day, and it's lovely. You'll have a lovely day when you listen to Lovely Day. <laughs> oh, I see Sin Cole right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, L- Leaky Lee, L-Y-K-K-E. Oh, yeah. 
She's yeah. great. Oh, yeah. 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 So there's a song, uh, I Follow Rivers, the magician yes. remix. That, oh, I listen to that on loop when I'm, like, working out. That's it's, a song that goes, so I, I follow. I follow. Yes. I follow you. Oh, it's so good. You know, I should have even done that because now I'm going to be singing that damn song all right? day. Yes. Right. Got Little, your I, earworm. Yeah, that is. <laughs> oh, Donna, totally I is. Will, I will get on the elliptical machine and I will play that on repeat and then just zone out. You know, like, yep. yeah. Good stuff. Hey, I've got some trivia. Fantastic. So, so Paula mentioned uh-huh. a song called Lovely Day. Lane. Lovely Stay Day. Lane, and, and I think mm-hmm. Don, Don would know. Remember Bill Withers, Don? Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. He yeah. had a song Absolutely. called Lovely, Lovely Day. Day. Lovely, Lovely Day. And, Day. And it has, the, it's mm. the record for the longest held note on, on an out, on a, on a single. I can remember the note. Held, he Lovely held the note. Uh, he held, yeah, he held it for like 29 seconds. Wow. So that's the record for the longest note held on a on a single. I guess it's a charting single. I would have never guessed that. Well, no? and that's okay. that that's that that's what we do here, Don. We drop the mic yeah. about Bill Withers. That's why I keep losing in trivia every time I'm on the show. <laughs> we should stop right there. That's good. What? You're not asking me oh. for my music? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> no, we should stop. Oh my God, I was so excited for this question, and then you're just ready to hang up the phone. <laughs> that's not the first time that's happened to Doug. He does it all the freaking time. <laughs> Doug, do you have one? Yeah, Donnie Osmond, you jackass. <laughs> Starship. Uh, yeah. uh, we, we built this city. I'm going to I'm going to go through I actually have I was t- I was sort of making a list I saw Paula you were kind of looking at a list cuz you didn't want to lose your thought I did the same thing uh cuz I'm into a bunch of different people right now um lately I've been listening to a lot of JJ Gray and Mofro JJ They've been around Gray. Yeah they've been around for a while but they just never kind of got pop- they're a big touring band really big in the southeast I think he's out of Jacksonville Florida I just love their sound um, you know, big horn section, real gravelly voice. Um, He's got a beard. Kind of, yeah, Jay Jager and, Mo- and Gray and Mofro is great. Anderson East, I like him a lot. Lucas Nelson's awesome. Uh, Tedeschi Trucks Band, you guys know them? Nope. Is that a new electric truck? No. Tedeschi Trucks, uh, Susan Tedeschi um, is like a singer. She's got a strong Bonnie Raitt vibe to her. And Darren Ooh. Trucks, like a la Allman Brothers, Trucks Family. Sure. Oh, I mean, they are unreal, and and actually, one of their songs is getting used. I think speaking of cars, Don, they're getting used in a in a car commercial right now. So you might recognize one of their songs. It's one of their mellower ones, but but the guitar solos and and Tedeschi Truck stuff is unbelievable. Both her solos and Derek Trucks, but um, two others. One Tosh Sultana. Tosh Sultana is this young woman out of Australia who made life as difficult for herself as she possibly could have as a young person, but learned how to play every single instrument that's ever been invented by a man, by a person. And she plays all of her own stuff. So she goes on tour and she has one of those sampling devices where she'll play a small piece, sample it, and then Loop it. keep on layering it yeah. on repeat. And she is unreal. Tosh Sultana is unbelievable. And the last one I'm going to mention, I'm guessing only person on this panel that knows this person uh, is Paul is Joe, and that person is Paul Weller. Oh, sure. And almost nobody in America knows Paul Weller. And in England and in Europe, this guy is, he, it's like saying, you know, do you know who Pete Townsend is? I mean, he is like the old school, they call him the mod father. He's the, the father right, of so much. Right now, Paul is British looking pop. up Pete Townsend. I know. <laughs> yeah. um, Pete Townsend. Mick I've, Jagger. I've heard that name. The, hey, he, can I throw something in here? Yeah. Now that you're mentioning I just forgot. I was recently, I recorded a, a voice job for a rapper. So I'm at the beginning of a rap song called Freaky Circus by a French <laughs> rapper named Wax Taylor. So check that one awesome. out. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love my, it. That's my strangest voice job, I think. I ever. love it. Freaky Circus, Wax Taylor. Do you know what's coming there after it you? It's on, it's on Spotify. Yeah. He's Have you popular listened to in it, France. Well, let's hear it. Have I listened? Well, yes. Yeah. I play yeah. it, but then we're going right. to get a takedown notice immediately. So, <laughs> yeah. So I can't. But um, it's on you. It is. It's so frustrating. Yeah. Freaky Circus. Go listen to it. And Paul Weller. And all those other bands. 
All of which sounded like, I got a whole list now. I know, right? I'm excited. Hey, we can, hey Don, were you good at, I, I think the term is hitting the post. Hitting the post when you were in your music uh, DJing. Oh, you know, yeah, I was really good. Yeah, I, 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 I was good. Not now. Apparently, I can't hit the post on this kind of a thing. But okay. Yeah, no, I, I was actually relatively good at it. You had to be on, on talk radio, too, because you had hard breaks. What, what does hitting the post mean? It means uh, you're, you're doing an intro into the song and, and then mm. coming when you, when you come right in, boom, there's the, there's the, uh, the well, lyric. Yeah. It's like, right. yeah, like heck, you know here a lot of songs will have like 75 degrees and yeah. we're going to be, and you know, bam, right at the right, right when the guy starts singing, there'll be like 10 up. seconds of just instrument before the person starts right. singing and the DJ's yeah. talking over the instrumental. And then the second that the singer is going to start singing, huh. Don, stop talking. It's an art. Wow. It's an art. Yeah, that's that, is, your that, post. that is quite a skill. I think maybe yeah. we missed this post. Yeah. Oh, we totally did. And it's <laughs> my fault. We flew right through it. <laughs>